top stars at this hour. Israeli Prime Minister forms war cabinet as response to Hamas attack. Four killed in train drill in India. Plus, three dead in drone strike in Ukraine's Belgorod region. Welcome to the World News on VOP TV. I'm Kayla Abraham. Fifteen Palestinians have died and scores injured on Thursday after the Israeli occupation army bombarded a house in Jabalia, north of Gaza Strip. According to Palestinian news agency, the occupation warplanes targeted a house in Jabalia, leaving 15 Palestinians dead and scores of injuries injuries in addition to massive destruction in the area. According to the latest reports, the ongoing Israeli aggression on Gaza Strip and the occupied West Bank since last Saturday has left 1,128 dead and 5,489 wounded. Meanwhile, the Operation Al-Aqsa flood in the Gaza envelope settlement has so far resulted in 1,200 killed and more than 2,900 injured, in addition to capturing men any occupation soldiers. Now, President Joe Biden on Wednesday has condemned the weekend attack by Hamas militants on Israel as the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust, as the number of U.S. citizens killed in the fighting ticked up to at least 22. Biden told Jewish leaders gathered at the White House that this attack was a campaign of pure cruelty, not just hate, but pure cruelty against the Jewish people. Beyond the 21 and 22 known to have been killed, the State Department noted at least 17 more Americans remain unaccounted for in a war that has already claimed more than 2,200 lives on both sides. A handful of U.S. citizens and among the estimated 150 hostages captured by Hamas militants during the shocking weekend assault in Israel. So, Signs of U.S. support for Israel were seen across the administration, with Secretary of State Antony Blinken traveling there for meetings, Biden denouncing anti-Semitism in America and the U.S. military moving a second aircraft carrier towards the Mediterranean Sea as part of efforts to prevent the war from spilling over into a more dangerous regional conflict. Now, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has announced an emergency government with an opposition party leader, Benny Gantz, for the duration of the war. Opposition le leader Yair Lapid has not joined Gantz, but a statement disclosed a seat will be reserved for him in the war cabinet. In a dramatic escalation of Mideast tensions, Israel declared war on Gaza, a response to a military operation by the Palestinian group Hamas in Israel territories. The conflicts began when Hamas initiated Initiated Operation Al Asqa flawed against Israel, a multi pronged surprise operation including a barrage of rocket launches and infiltrations into Israel via land, sea, and air, which Hamas said was in retaliation for the storming of the Al Aqsa Mosque in occupied East Jerusalem and Israeli settlers' growing violence against Palestinians. In response to Hamas's actions, the Israeli military launched Operation Sword of Iron against Hamas targets within Gaza. Still, the United Nations Palestinian Refugee Agency, UNRWA, has stated it was seeking $104 million for life-saving aid to Gaza, which has been pounded by Israeli reprisal strikes following attacks by Hamas against Israel. UNRWA, which was already facing financial difficulties, stated it had enough funding to continue its regular services, including education, health care and social protection across the region until the end of of October. In January, the UN agency had appealed for $1.6 billion in funding, when it was struggling to fulfill its mandates due to spiraling cost and shrinking resources. Established in 1949, following the first Arab Israeli war, UNRWA provides public services including schooling, primary health care, and humanitarian aid in Gaza, the West Bank, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. 
Meanwhile, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is scheduled to meet with Jordanian King Abdullah II and U.S. State Secretary Antony Blinken to stop the devastating war in Gaza. In a statement, Hussein al-Sheikh, the Secretary of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, PLO's Executive Committee, stated that the Palestinian President will meet with King Abdullah II on Thursday to seek an end to the ongoing war in Gaza. He also added that Abbas will meet with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Friday. Blinking on Thursday and back on an official visit to Israel to meet with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and to show support to Israel in the ongoing war with Palestinian groups in Gaza. Over, uh, over 1,200 Palestinians and 1,300 Israelis have been killed since the start of the Israel-Palestine conflict on Saturday. In a dramatic escalation of Mid-East tensions, Israeli forces have launched a sustained and forceful military campaign against the Gaza Strip, a response to a military offensive by the Palestinian group Hamas in Israeli territories. Now, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi and Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman have discussed the situation in Palestine and their first phone call since the two countries restored ties in March after seven years. Mohammed Jamshidi, Raisi's deputy chief of staff for political affairs, noted in a statement on X that the two agreed on the need to end war crimes against Palestine. Jamshidi mentioned further that the call lasted 45 minutes. Iran and Saudi Arabia restored diplomatic ties in March after a seven-year hiatus following marathon two-year talks brokered by Iraq, Oman and China. Now a passenger train had derailed in eastern India, killing four people and injuring dozens. A magistrate in Shaul Agarwal stated that all 21 coaches of the North East Express train on its way to the state of Assam from New Delhi derailed near the Raghunthapur rail station in Buxar district of the state Bihar. Local residents rushed to the scene and helped passengers exit the derailed coaches. Police officer Deepak Kumar mentioned that ambulances later arrived in hospitals were alerted to receive injured passengers. DK Pathak, a, ro a railroad official who was on the train when it derailed, stated that most injuries occurred in one of the derailed coaches. Early reports stated that 70 passengers were injured, while Agawal noted that 31 of the injured were hospitalized. Hospitalized. Although we were able to go home after medical attention, the cause of the derailment is still being investigated. Now, a Russian official has stated on Thursday that debris from a downed Ukrainian drill killed three people in the Belgorod region of Russia. Yacheslav Gledklov, the regional governor, mentioned in Telegram that the debris destroyed a house and that three bodies were recovered from the rubble. Russia's defense ministry also stated it thwarted a Ukrainian drone attack with air defenses down in a drone over Belgorod. Belgorod is one of the Russian regions that borders Ukraine. Ukraine the military also noted on, Sunday, on Thursday that Russia attacked overnight with 33 drones targeting multiple regions and that Ukrainian air defenses destroyed 28 of the aerial vehicles. One of the targets head regions was Odessa in southern Ukraine, where officials reported damage to port infrastructure and residential buildings. At least one person was injured. Odessa has been a frequent target of Russian aerial attacks. Now, the talks between party chiefs and the president of the two houses of the parliament at Elise come ahead of a televised speech on Thursday night in which Macron is to address the terrorist acts committed in Israel. The head of state was in Hamburg for two days of Franco-German meetings with Chancellor Olaf Schwartz earlier this week, during which both leaders voiced their support to the Israeli government. Eleven French nationals were killed in, in Saturday's violence, and a further 18 people remain missing, including several children. The French government has warned the death toll would likely rise. A chartered Air France flight was due to arrive in Tel Aviv on Thursday to repatriate French nationals who have been unable to leave. The events in the Middle East have provoked a strong emotion in France, home to Europe's largest Jewish and Muslim communities. Past wars in Gaza have triggered mass protests in France, mostly in solidarity with Palestinians. Police have arrested more than 20 people in relation 
opposition to more than 100 anti-Semitic acts reported since Saturday's attack by Hamas. Now, the U.S. Embassy in Tunisia stated, has stated that on Wednesday it will close to the public for routine services on Thursday and Friday in an abundance caution due to expected pro-Palestinian protest in the country. A national protest is expected to take place on Thursday with the participation of most of the country's political parties and groups, including the powerful labor union UGTT, which has a large popular base. Demonstrations will also take place on Friday as Hamas leaders called for a day of support throughout the Arab world. The planned protest follow, follow Israeli reprisal strikes and blockaded Gaza that have killed 1,100 persons and wounded 5,339 after Hamas militants killed at least 1,200 Israelis, mostly civilians, in a rampage after breaching the fence enclosing Gaza on Saturday. In 2012, hundreds of protesters attacked the U.S. Embassy in Tunis over a film denigrating the Prophet Muhammad, an attack in which Tunisian police killed four protesters. Meanwhile, Iranian Foreign Minister Hossein Ahmed Abdullahian will visit Lebanon. It is noted that within the framework of the visit, the situation on the Lebanese-Israeli border, as well as the military conflicts between Israel and Hamas, will be discussed. A combined attack was carried out on Israel on October 7. From the beginning, a massive rocket attack began from the territory of the Gaza Strip, followed by the penetration of militants by land, water and air. The Israel Defense Force IDF declared a state of readiness for war after a massive rocket attack from the Gaza Strip. Moreover, Israel Defense Minister Yoav Gallant announced a mass gathering of reservists. The Israeli army's operation against Hamas goes by the codename Swords of Iron. Now, the wife of Gabon's deposed leader Ali Bongo has been jailed. Gabon army officers seized power on August 30, annual, annulling an election minutes after an announcement that President Ali Bongo had won, which they said was not credible. Bongo, in power since 2009, had succeeded his father, Omar Bongo, who ruled for 42 years. Now, Cameroonian authorities have denied abandoning victims of the deadly landslides in the, cap in the capital, Yaoundé. Sunday's landslide in the low-income Mbakolo neighborhood left at least 31 persons dead and destroyed homes and displacing families. The local administrator in charge of coordinating emergency assistance disclosed that the people complaining of not having a place to stay had chosen not to go to temporary accommodation provided by the government. Dauda Osmanu told reports that some homeless victims opted to join their family members elsewhere, while about 16 others were being taken care of at a center several kilometers away from the disaster site. But some victims have said they still have not received any aid. So far, Cameroonian authorities say about 40 families have received assistance from the government and more had been expecting to get theirs on Wednesday. The UN peacekeeping mission in Democratic Republic of Congo has suspended some of its peacekeepers in response to reports of serious misconduct. It did not state how many peacekeepers were suspended or give any details of accusations against them. The mission, known as MONUSCO, has faced previous accusation of sexual abuse, of which the United Nations has vowed to crack down on. The measures include suspension from duty and confinement to quarters pending an investigation. The UN peacekeeping mission in Congo, which was initially established during a civil war that lasted from 1998 to 2003, has some 17,000 personnel deployed in the east of the country, where various militias and rebel groups continue to fight. Now, Kenya will end a six-year agreement that allowed more than 100 Cuban doctors to work in Kenyan hospitals. Health Minister Suzanne Unkamucha disclosed this on Wednesday that the move will help address challenges faced by Kenyan health workers, including the lack of employment opportunities. A 2017 deal established an exchange program in which Cuban doctors would help the, fill the gap in 
County hospitals while Kenya will travel to Cuba for specialized medical training. It was unpopular with Kenyan medical professionals who argued that local doctors had the requisite training just as their Cuban counterparts did. There were also concerns that the government, that the Kenyan government was paying the Cuban professionals much more than Kenyan counterparts, even as some locally trained doctors remained unemployed. Doctors and other health workers in Kenya have often gone on strike to demand their higher wages, better working conditions, and for more doctors to be hired. Now, an official from his party has disclosed that George Weir, Liberia's, Liberia's president, will accept the result of Tuesday's general election. But Koije ruled out the possibility of defeat for Weir, a 57-year-old former football star. Election officials have stated that the turnout for Liberia's fourth post war was high. Votes continue to be counted. The Electoral Commission will Commission will begin to release the result at 4.30 local time. We are expected to face a strongest challenge from former Vice President Joseph Boakai, who is 78 years old, which, who is also from the Unite Party. Unite Party. Boakai was deputy to Ellen J Johnson Solif when she was president. Now, Senegalese President Macky Sall on Wednesday named a new finance and energy minister as part of government reshuffle four months ahead of election. Sall dismissed the government and reappointed Prime Minister Amador Ba on Friday without explaining the reasoning behind the decision. Among other changes, former Interior Minister Antoine Doame, who was criticized by the opposition for the government's crackdown on widespread protests earlier this year, was appointed oil and earnings. Energy Minister. Senegal will next year begin producing oil and gas from large offshore fields, which are expected to transform the West African country's economy over the coming decades. Mamadou Mustafa Ba will run the finance and budget ministry. Dabdou Ka will run the economy ministry. Now the FBI and the Office of Ghana's Special Prosecutor OSP are looking into the assets and financial transaction of embattled former minister Cecilia Abena Dapa and her associates in the U.S. The former sanitation minister is currently under investigation by the OSP on allegations of corruption and corruption-related offenses stemming from the discovery of over $1 million in cash at her residence. The money came to public attention after it was stolen by two domestic staff and Dapper herself called the police. She was forced to resign when some Ghanaians and MPs, and MPs questioned the source of the money. The former sanitation minister is now reported to have filed an application in court seeking to stop the office of the special prosecutor from investigating her and her husband. Dapa has, however, denied all allegations. Now, the authorities in South Africa's Western Cape province are searching for six prisoners who escaped from the holding cell of a magistrate's court. One of the prisoners has been arrested, but the other five are still on the run. Authorities said that prisoners aged between 20 and 33 are armed and dangerous. The prisoners were waiting to be transported to a correctional detention facility after appearing in court earlier on Wednesday. The offenders were on trial for multiple serious charges, including murder, attempted murder, aggravated robbery and assault. Following the escape, the authorities have further charged them with escape from lawful custody, attempted murder and robbery of a firearm. Zimbabwe's main opposition party, the Citizens Coalition for Change, CCC, has rebuffed reports that its president, Nelson Chaminsa, has been expelled from the party. The rumor followed a press statement supposedly issued by Sensego Sasabango, who purports to be the party, party's interim secretary general. The statement announced on Chaminsa's expulsion for lighting of charges, including embezzlement of party funds and nepotism. The document is the subject of much social media debate, with some suggesting a party split is imminent. CCC spokesperson Pramis Mkwakwa Nazi told the reporters that Tasabango was not a member of the party, but a minion of the ruling Zanzu PF party. The assembly, revealed to be the highest decision-making body in the party, discussed a turbulent few days for the 
party in which a letter written by Sasabangu led to 15 CCC members losing their parliamentary seats. Protests in parliament then led to the suspension of all CCC MPs for six sittings and the docking their, and docking their pay. The assembly also stated that the CCC's legal department would give the Speaker of Parliament two weeks to resign the recall of the 15 CCC members. Should the Speaker refuse to comply with their request, McWanzi stated that the party's MPs and councillors would disengage from Parliament and local councils and it will activate unspecified citizens' actions. And that is it on World News and VOP TV. I am Kayla Abraham. VOP Business Show is coming up next. Stay tuned.